James Mukey. I'm an eye surgeon based in Adelaide. I'm also chair of a not-for-profit called Sight for All. And I was Australian of the Year for 2020. And I used that platform to raise awareness of type 2 diabetes and, for, and to advocate for patients with this devastating, life-changing, life-threatening disease. Actually, it's really only been over the last three years, Tracy, that I've changed my thinking about health. Uh, I'm an eye surgeon, so part of my, a very significant part of my work is to deal with the blinding complications of type 2 diabetes, which is a largely avoidable man-made dietary disease. And I've been dealing with this disease now for 30 years, but what I've noticed, uh, particularly over the last few years, is the growth in the number of patients with sight-threatening eye disease due to their diabetes. And this really largely reflects the, the growth of type 2 diabetes in our society, which is now in the order of 1.8 million people. But it's really just the tip of the iceberg because uh, the majority of Australian adults, Australian men, are metabolically unhealthy. This is what's driving the chronic disease epidemic in our society. But I never saw it as my role to have the lifestyle discussions, to have the diet discussions with my patients. I always thought that was the GPs, the dietitians, the nutritionists that were having that discussion. And about three years ago, really, I think I had a, a, an experience uh, with a patient. Actually, he wasn't a patient. I was, uh, I suppose, putting together um, a documentary of talking heads of patients who are, who are blind to really investigate, explore the experience of blindness. And, and one of these was a guy called Neil Hansel, who went to bed at the age of 50 and woke up the next morning blind in both eyes due to his diabetes. And his story, it was such a powerful and confronting story. It really made me sit back and think about this um, a little more deeply. And uh, then I, I came across a, a book of, of Jason Fung's, uh, which was called The Diabetes Code. And I learned that you could actually not only prevent type 2 diabetes, which I think as a, a doctor, I should have been pretty aware of, um, not exactly how, but certainly the opportunity to put type 2 diabetes into remission was something I, I wasn't aware of. And uh, really, it's been a, a fascinating journey since that time, and then winning the Australian of the Year Award and deciding that this is what I was going to use that platform for is taking me on this extraordinary journey, which has allowed me to really think so much more deeply about um, what's driving this, which is ultimately our poor diet. Yeah, so about two thirds of Australian adults are overweight or obese, which basically means they're metabolically unhealthy. But this is, uh, this is, um, uh, probably underestimating the amount of people who are metabolically unhealthy. What we know in America now, 93% of American adults are metabolically unhealthy. What does that mean? It means that they're putting themselves at significant risk of a whole range of really unpleasant diseases. Uh, type 2 diabetes is certainly, to me, the big baddie um, and its complications, which include stroke, uh, heart attack, dementia, it's links to cancer, amputation of legs due to gangrene. It's a devastating disease. Uh, so um, the root cause of all this, this is, is a condition called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is driven by a number of dietary factors uh, that, um, uh, 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 that mean that we're not able to cope with the intake of, of sugars and carbohydrates in our diet. How do we know whether we're metabolically unhealthy? Well, quite a good guide is just to simply measure your, the circumference of your waist. And if it's more than half of uh, your height, then there's an indication that you have what's called abdominal obesity, which means that you likely have uh, what's called a fatty liver or visceral obesity, which is really uh, core to this whole process. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's a number of... Uh, markers, blood tests that we can do to see if we're metabolically unhealthy. And what I do now with many of my patients, uh, the ones that let's say don't have a diagnosis of pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, but if I'm concerned they're metabolically unhealthy, I will, uh, I, I will ask the GP or even organize it myself to do a fasting blood insulin level. Because once 
the patient has prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, the blood sugar level is starting to rise. But before that, we will see a rise in the blood insulin level uh, well before that. Uh, the other thing that one can consider, certainly if they have um, a, uh, a bit of a belly, which is what I had a couple of years ago, I actually had a liver ultrasound. I had a liver ultrasound because I had a sore back, not, not uh, thinking that I had a fatty liver. And I found out that I had a fatty liver. And, and those of you who have seen me, I'm, I'm tall and thin, and I was tall and thin two years ago. And um, that was a bit of a shock, a bit of a, a wake up call for me. Um, so a fatty liver, uh, you, can, you can ask your GP to organize a liver ultrasound. And um, the other one that I think is a really good indicator is your triglyceride level. And if your triglyceride level is, is over one, then I would be um, asking my GP to perform, perform what's called a lipid subfraction analysis. So I, I think it's important for um, the listeners are not to be focused on total cholesterol or uh, LDL as such, but there's actually a subfraction of LDL, which are small and dense. So the small, dense LDL particles, which are the driver of um, the, the metabolic dysfunction here. And um, that, that a good proxy for doing that is to just simply to look at your triglyceride level. If your triglyceride levels are under one, then you're highly unlikely to have those small dense particles. If your triglyceride level is, is um, over 1.5, which is about 40% of the uh, adult population, then I would be very concerned. And what's driving the small dense uh, particle formation? Uh, it's the sugars in the diet. Uh, it's the, uh, particularly the fructose element. And it's uh, the seed oil elements, the, what we euphemistically call vegetable oils, which are, are driving these small dense particles, which get into the artery wall, causing inflammation, causing uh, plaque formation, and blockage of, of blood vessels. I was in that boat a couple of years ago, and uh, it was actually just as we were going into the lockdown of that first um, COVID outbreak. And uh, again, you know, going back to Jason Fung's book, uh, he recommended um, intermittent fasting. And uh, it's something that my wife has always done. And it's something that I'd never considered doing. You know, I always had my, uh, my cereal. I often have a huge bowl of cornflakes with Milo on it. I'd, I'd start the day with a sweet yogurt, a couple of glasses of orange juice and, and, and a sweet fruit. And uh, so I really started the, the day with a hugely sugary, carb-heavy diet. Uh, no wonder that was just the tip of the iceberg, actually. The, the, the day unfolded uh, uh, with a, a bunch of other sugary treats. So um, the first thing I did was, was just simply to have an intermittent fast. And for me, that is a 16-8 fast, which means that from about, I don't know, 7 o'clock through to whatever that is, 16 hours later, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I don't eat anything. And all that means is just not having breakfast. And no, uh, it took me a week or so of um, feeling a bit hungry and, and really looking forward to lunch. But now it's just part of my routine. So an intermittent 16 8 fast is not hard. Uh, and um, it, what happens when you fast is that your insulin level dramatically drops. And insulin is a fat storage hormone, amongst other things. But when your insulin level drops, you actually mobilize fat from your fat stores. So uh, fast is a great thing to do. And as we get older, uh, both men and women, uh, we do lose muscle mass. So if you're going to go into an intermittent fast, it's important to keep your protein up in your diet, you know, at least 100 grams a day. Uh, and then what we also need to do is continue to work on uh, promoting our muscle mass. So we need to do that by making sure we have enough protein in our diet, but also do resistance training, weight training. So to build up your muscles rather than let them waste away is really important because the muscles act as a huge source of um, uh, to metabolize the triglycerides in our diet. And it's a great way to uh, prevent um, you going down the pathway of, of type 2 diabetes and, and other chronic diseases, but also sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting, which is a, unfortunately all too common in the elderly, which gives rise to frailty, fragility, falls and fractures. So there, there are a couple of good tips. Of course, smoking is, uh, is important. Uh, and we know that our poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than smoking, alcohol, and inactivity combined. So we can't outrun a, a poor diet. It's really the, the key thing here is, is our diet. 
And what I would recommend to, to prevent uh, chronic disease and type 2 diabetes, rather than looking at remission, remission is a whole other thing, but to prevent it, I would be avoiding as much as possible um, sugar in your diet, particularly added sugars and uh, refined carbohydrates, so products made from white flour, white rice and uh, peeled white potatoes. And I would be avoiding seed oil, so the vegetable oils. I'd be uh, avoiding cooking things, or even if you can, and it's very difficult to avoid uh, eating food that's been, been deep fried in, in seed oils, particularly fast foods. But if you look at refined carbohydrates, sugars, seed oils, they're the major components of ultra-processed foods, or what I prefer to call ultra-processed food-like substances. These are unhealthy substances which combine the worst elements of all of those individual substances and are like a loaded gun which point at your liver uh, causing metabolic dysfunction. So I would avoid ultra-processed foods, packaged foods, really focus on real foods, fresh foods, healthy foods, whole foods, uh, in order to avoid all of those really unpleasant um, uh, uh, unpleasant complications. So coming back to exercises, as I say, you can't outrun a bad diet. Exercise is important, particularly for mental health, and it's important to keep up a level of exercise, uh, which is um, also involves that resistance training. And uh, what else? Getting out in the morning, getting a good night's sleep is important to um, avoid uh, chronic diseases. Get out in the morning, get that early morning sun. Uh, and there are a number of other strategies like that. I think uh, when you are feeling um, that everything's getting too much and there's a lot of stress in your life, rather than turning to addictive substances, and we know sugar and uh, ultra processed foods are addictive, uh, there are lots of other healthier options you can take, you know, getting out into nature, uh, reaching out to other people, do a good deed, uh, listening to music is often a great way to help uh, to alleviate that stress, the, the cortisol that's flooding your body during those anxious times. Yes, well, I, I lost a father to dementia. He was in a dementia ward for six years and I watched that terrible demise of my dad and uh, who was a very proud, intelligent man and, and um, it was just devastating. So this is, a, this is a disease that impacts broadly, not just on the individual, but on the whole family and, and not wanting to be selfish. My mother was admitted uh, with a stroke last night. So I've been up half the night in the hospital with mum. Uh, and so... You know, you, okay, we want to live a long life because I think, not I think, I know that the world is an extraordinary place and there's so much to experience. You know, there's more than enough for any one lifetime. I would love to live forever, actually. Uh, but you don't want to live forever or have a long life when it's racked by chronic disease. And the man I mentioned earlier in the interview um, who went blind due to his diabetes He's also had uh, his left leg amputated a couple of years ago. It was on the back of nine amputations over a 14 month period. He's had two heart attacks and he's now faced with, you know, potentially more heart attacks, um, strokes and dementia. Uh, and, and that's not a way to live your life. I think that this life is, is precious uh, and there's so much to experience and you want to, to avoid having your final years or even your final decades being being hamstrung by chronic disease. And so uh, I'm doing everything I can to avoid that. And, and, and basically for me, that means, uh, you know, avoiding, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a strict low carb, I certainly am, am not in the ketogenic uh, diet. Certainly if I was, um, if I had type two diabetes, I'd be, I'd be looking that. Uh, so it's all about, individualizing and maximizing your metabolic health becoming insulin sensitive and so uh, I think if we know where we are in that spectrum then what we should be doing is everything we can to avoid all these really unpleasant uh, diseases in our life and, and also the impact it has on society on on the health system uh, you know my mother was in, in the hospital last night and she's probably still not admitted to the war because there's so many people in this same situation. So I think the, the best thing we can do in society to improve our metabolic health, to prevent the ambulance ramping situation, to reduce this huge impact on society, on the taxpayer of the chronic disease epidemic that we're amongst and, and is just getting worse from year to year. Mm.